Hi, I'm James Patrick, the director of Big Picture. In this interview, I caught up with Patrick Fagan in Portugal. He's a behavioral influence expert who works for brands and politicians to help them nudge the public and subtly influence them. He worked for firms such as Cambridge Analytica. We spoke with him about his thoughts on the influence tactics deployed by governments to make us compliant to the lockdowns and the mass vaccinations. I'm Patrick Fagan, I'm a behavioral scientist. Uh, my elevator pitch, I suppose, professionally, is that I turn minds into money. So I was the lead psychologist at Cambridge Analytica for about eight months until the end of the company when it was liquidated. Um, and people really didn't like Cambridge Analytica. They didn't like the idea that your psychological traits could be used to manipulate you into voting for someone you might not otherwise have voted for. People hated that. And yet we're moving to something that is so much more sinister, more extreme than that uh, with the way technology is going. So with the data points that are fairly freely available on somebody now, uh, you can predict a whole load of things with them with predictive analytics. You can, for example, predict personality based on Spotify plays or financial transactions or uh, Netflix views. Uh, so for example, if somebody watches reality shows on Netflix and if they listen to pop music, then there's a pretty good chance that they're an extrovert. Um, so the data points today, you can predict personality. You can also predict quite personal things like drug use, sexuality and mental health. Um, so data points can predict these things today. Uh, and the government wants to take, essentially take all those data points and attach them to a centralized digital ID. So the government will be able to read your mind completely, really. So it will become omniscient in that sense. Uh, and then with vaccine passports, the government will also become omnipotent because they will be able to take these data predictions and use them to say, yes, you can come in a restaurant or no, you can't come in a restaurant. We've predicted that you will criticize the government. Uh, so therefore you're banned from using your electric car until you do X, Y, Z. Um, and so that's, as I say, Cambridge Analytica on crack. That's so, so much worse than what happened with Cambridge Analytica. And this is to say nothing of uh, technology like Neuralink, which in theory will be directly connected to your brain and will be able to literally read and change your mind at the source. The Neuralink, uh, in theory, is a interface that connects your brain directly to technology, specifically the internet. Um, so you'll be connected to a Twitter feed 24 hours a day, for example. Awesome, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Looking like, forward to that, huh? Yeah, how can you look at the effect of technology so far and be like, yeah, uh -huh. sign me up, for <laughs> plug and it yeah, into my brain. So I take the academic science side of psychology uh, and think about how to actually practically apply that for businesses. In what ways can it be applied? Uh, well, in particular, it can be used for nudging. Uh, which is how to influence behavior one way or another. Uh, so the point of nudging is that we are all what's known as cognitive misers. We have very limited attention spans for processing information and responding to the world. Uh, so we have to rely on very quick shortcuts. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, if something is popular, we assume it must be good. Uh, so that's one thing you can do. If you're McDonald's, for example, you can use social proof and say billions of people buy our burgers cheap. In COVID, uh, in the lockdowns and so on, it was very much used uh, rather heavy, heavy handedly. I would say in an almost totalitarian sense, because it was unlike, say, Coca-Cola, who just want you to buy more Coke. In this case, it was all parts of everyone's lives, you know, going to the gym, meeting your friends, leaving the house, everything uh, was, was influenced by this agenda. And so I think the use of behavioral science techniques here is probably a bit heavy handed. They were really trying to, and still are in many other respects as well, trying to get inside people's heads and rewire what they find there. Um, so there's an advisor to the World Economic Forum called um, Yuval Harari, uh, and he says humans are hackable. He talks about hackable humans. Uh, and you see this, for example, with trying to get people to eat insects because nobody wants to eat insects. It's disgusting. We have a hardwired instinctive aversion to it. And yet there's this constant propaganda and nudging to try and get inside our heads and rewire it and change what we think is okay or acceptable. Um, and that seems a little odd to me. Why is that odd? Um, because it's not natural. It's not normal. So, so why are they trying to tweak with what already exists and what has evolved over many millions of years uh, to think that they 
know better than evolved uh, hardwired instincts seems quite kind of um, uh, maniacal, really. Do you have some examples of, of these techniques being used with COVID? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I have uh, two examples here. Um, one is an advert that was uh, very kind of well known in the UK, um, which was the look him in the eyes campaign. And so they had these various images of an ill person in hospital and they had a messaging like, look him in the eyes and tell him you always keep a safe distance. So primarily they're using fear uh, to make you feel scared and, and maybe stressed and maybe there's a bit of, of guilt in there as well. But primarily it's fear. Um, and fear is, H.P. Lovecraft said, it's the oldest and strongest emotion. And there is some brain scanning, scanning research to support that as well. Um, fear is the emotion that's most likely to activate the amygdala, the emotion center of the brain. So fear is a very, very powerful thing. Um, now, when you're scaring people, you're building up all this negative energy. It's kind of like steam in an engine, but it needs to be directed somewhere. So as well as uh, building up fear, they're also using efficacy by telling people exactly what they do, should do, giving them very simple uh, direct instructions. Uh, so they're using fear and efficacy. Uh, they're also using what's called the watching eyes effect, where if you feel like you're being watched, you're more likely to do what you're told and act in a seemingly pro-social way. There's a lot of experiments on this. Uh, people are more likely to put money in a charity box. Uh, they're less likely to steal, that kind of thing, if there's a picture of a pair of eyes. They're also using what's called the identifiable victim effect. This is essentially, as the saying goes, the death of one is a tragedy. The death of millions is just a statistic. So if you give uh, a story a single person with a name and a face and a background, uh, that's more effective than giving people kind of rational statistics. So you can see they've given a, a picture of someone and given him a name and a story. Uh, they're also using messenger effects where we are more likely to accept a message if it comes from someone we trust or like. Uh, so they have a clear NHS logo in the top. And finally, they're using accountability by saying, you have to look him in the eyes and tell him you'll do this. Uh, because otherwise we tend to diffuse responsibility. We think, oh, someone else will take care of it. The group will take care of it. I don't have to. So they're trying to make people feel uh, directly accountable. What do you think about all this, like uh, using marketing? like that? Well, I feel a bit mixed about it because uh, full transparency, I do it. I do it for a living, uh, but I do it for, for brands, which I think is a little bit different because with a brand, you have a very defined limit to what they want and what, they, uh, what their goal is. So let's take Coca-Cola as an example. Um, and I've never worked for Coke, but just as an example, they want people to buy Coke and there's a kind of selfishness in that, there, but there's an honesty in that selfishness. Uh, they want you to give them money in exchange for this product. Uh, they don't have a team of people dedicated to fighting Coca-Cola hesitancy, for example. They don't think they're on a moral crusade to get 100% of the world drinking Coca-Cola. Um, so I think actually counterintuitively, it's more ethical or at least less unethical to help brands with this mm -hmm. than it is to help governments because governments, number one, are backed up with force at the end of the day. And number two, they have a total mandate in all areas of people's lives. Uh, and number three, they have a kind of um, arrogance, I suppose, uh, a kind of single mindedness. And so there's an old saying who guards the guardians, uh, but there's also should be a saying who nudges the nudges because these people who are putting these social engineering programs into place, they are equally as irrational and biased as the rest of us. So for them to have this single-mindedness and this huge power can actually be quite dangerous because they could be wrong, they could be biased and irrational too. Uh, so really the key principle in classic brainwashing is to break people down so that you can remake them in a new image. Uh, so when people are really confused or overwhelmed or stressed, there becomes what the CIA referred to in their interrogation manual as a moment of suspended animation. Uh, cult experts call it a cognitive collapse leading to a cognitive vacuum. Uh, but the point is you're kind of disintegrated psychologically and it creates this fluid state uh, where it's much more easy to implant new behaviors, new uh, habits and thoughts and so on. Um, so on an experimental basis, a smaller basis in psychology, there's something called disrupt then reframe, where you try and bamboozle people a little bit and then they're much more suggestible afterwards. So if you say, uh, buy this uh, pen for three pounds, that's a lot less effective than saying, 
buy this pen for 3,000 pennies or 300 pennies, it's a bargain because you don't normally hear things in pennies. So that confuses you and you're disrupted. And then the it's a bargain message is much more likely to be accepted because you've kind of uh, stalled or disrupted people's cognitive defenses to the message. Hypnotists as well, magicians, uh, they try and kind of bamboozle you and confuse you a little bit to then implant suggestions in your mind. Uh, cults tend to um, find people who are at a confusing, uh, disintegrated point in their life. Uh, so if you've just had a death in the family or been to a divorce or something, you're much more likely to join a cult or a multi-level multi marketing scheme, a pyramid scheme, uh, because you're in that fluid, kind of deconstructed place psychologically. What else have we seen with COVID that you found a little alarming? So I've seen just nudges constantly, constant uh, reframing of information, strategic placement of information, rather than just being upfront with people um, and trusting in the wisdom of crowds, believing that people can be rational and will do the right thing, has been quite depressing. Um, for example, the manipulation of statistics, they would constantly say the absolute number of deaths or cases every day, whereas they could have said the percentage of tests that had been positive, that would have been much smaller much less scary. They could even have said the percentage of the population that's tested positive. That would be a fraction of a fraction of a percentage probably at most times. Um, so they deliberately presented statistics and information in a way that would scare and manipulate people. Um, and then even what they did with policy announcements was clearly nudged. Um, they would follow what I call the deny, debate, demand. Uh, process where first of all they would deny they were going to do something so they would say no 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 we'll, we'll never introduce vaccine passports or we have no plans to do vaccine passports uh, but what that does is it seeds the idea of vaccine passports in people's minds in a kind of uh, comfortable non-threatening way um, so then people start to become familiar and comfortable with the idea of vaccine passports um, and then they move to the debate stage where they would say well we should at least consider vaccine passports and then finally, uh, by December last year, they introduced uh, vaccine passports. So they were using something called the foot in the door technique here, which is a very kind of gradual way of doing things because we don't really notice gradual changes. Well, we, they were definitely coordinating on behavioral science in a overt way. You know, the World Health Organization has a behavioral science team, for example, and they were coordinating messaging uh, for vaccines and lockdowns and face masks. So they were definitely explicitly sharing these techniques. Yeah, I don't know if they have a playbook or if they're just following, if it's herd behavior themselves, if they're doing social proof themselves. Oh, that country did it, so we'll do it too. Um, but yeah, I saw it too worldwide. So this is a text that the government sent to uh, Brits uh, to get them to get the COVID vaccine. And it's a very powerful use of nudging. So in a 19 word sentence, they've managed to fit six nudges. Uh, so the sentence reads, you have reached the top of the queue and are a priority for getting a free NHS COVID-19 vaccine. The nudges that they've used are social proof in saying that there's a queue uh, because they're inferring that it's popular and therefore it must be good and trustworthy. Uh, by saying you've reached the top of the queue, they're using a nudge called commitment and consistency where if you feel invested and committed to something, you're more likely to follow through. So you don't want to lose your spot in the queue in this place. Uh, by saying you've reached the top of the queue, they're using ego appeals to make you feel special, like you're better than everyone else below you. Uh, by saying you're a priority, they're using scarcity uh, by implying that the supply doesn't meet demand and therefore making you feel an urgency to go and get it. Uh, by giving it to you for free, they're using reciprocity effects where you feel obligated to repay the favor. And finally, by having it come from the NHS, they're using messenger effects where we're more likely to accept a message that comes from somebody we like or trust. So I've really struggled with this though over the last two years. How could people who are so smart uh, be so stupid in some senses? So I did a lot of thinking about what are the psychological proce processes going on here. Essentially, it boils down to two things. People like to be liked and they like to be right. So on the people like to be liked side, uh, we don't want to be kicked out of our group or our tribe. Uh, we like to say the right things so that we fit in. And on the uh, like to be right side, 
uh, we don't like our view of the world being destroyed. So if you believe that the government is good and benevolent and trustworthy, you don't really like information that might suggest that uh, you're wrong. Um, and we have certain kind of defense mechanisms that stop ourselves from being traumatized. The brain won't let you hurt it, basically. So that's where things like denial come into place. Uh, so specifically, uh, we have willful blindness, which is also known as the ostrich effect, where people won't look at something that's potentially psychologically traumatic. Uh, one study found that when the stock market is doing poorly, people are less likely to log into their investment apps, uh, which doesn't make sense, but people don't like to look at painful information. And then the next one is cognitive dissonance, where if we encounter something that doesn't fit our worldview, uh, it's painful and creates a psychological tension and frustration called dissonance. Uh, and we have certain defense mechanisms uh, to protect us from that. So we might just deny that something exists or we might use thought stoppers like, oh, they're a conspiracy theorist. I don't need to listen to what they're saying. Uh, and the next one is system justification. Uh, this is about the fact that if you're raised in a system, in an institution like a country or a society and you've benefited from it and you've had a good time and so on, uh, you can't comprehend really, you can't countenance the idea that the system might be wrong, that it could be immoral or broken. So the next one is terror management theory, which is about the fact we don't like to think about our mortality. Uh, we're all essentially decaying into dust and that's quite a scary thought. So whenever something comes along that might remind us of our mortality, we try not to think about it or we attach ourselves to authorities or, or existing powerful structures uh, to feel more secure. Uh, the next one, conformity, is about the fact that we assume the crowd has something right. If everyone believes something, we assume they must know what they're talking about. And also, from an evolutionary point of view, we don't want to get kicked out of the crowd because evolutionarily that would mean death. So if everyone's saying something, A, we believe it's true, and B, we don't want to disagree because it could be risky to do so. Uh, the next one is about the in-group. Uh, where essentially if information comes from them, from the out-group, we're less likely to accept it or believe it. So if, if something comes from the anti-vaxxers or the conspiracy theorists or even uh, from the Republicans um, or, or likewise from the libtards. You or know, from works. Trump, right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, from Trump, it works. It works both ways. But um, if it comes from them, then people kind of shut down immediately uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't fit their tribal worldview. The next one is cognitive misers, which is about the fact that we are all cognitive misers. We all have limited attention spans, limited time, limited physical energy. So we can't read all of uh, Geert van den Bosch's papers, for example. Uh, we can't watch all of Mike Yedin's videos, uh, that kind of thing. We, can't, we don't have the time or the energy to process all of this information. So we have to go on gut, we have to trust authority, we have to trust the crowd about certain things. The next one is learned helplessness. Uh, so when people feel that they don't have any control over anything, uh, they won't even bother to try. So this is people who, when you say maybe something malevolent might be happening or some incompetence, they're like, I just don't want to know. I don't want to hear about it. There's nothing I can do about it. So why are you telling me? Uh, the next one is authority, which is about the fact that as cognitive misers, we have to trust authority figures when they tell us something. Um, as I say, we can't look at all of the science for things ourselves, so we have to trust that experts know what they're talking about. And the final one is regression, uh, which is about the fact that at our hearts, we all like to submit to something, uh, some people more than others. But we all kind of want to go back to being a child who is very comfortable being told what to do, uh, having our hand held and so on. Uh, being an adult and taking risk and responsibility is effortful and scary and most people don't like to do it. So most people, or I would say all people in some respect, look for some kind of structure, some kind of authority to tell them what to do. It could be, um, it could be religion, uh, it could also be the government. It, it, it doesn't matter as long as there's some kind of structure to, to help save people from the chaos. The point of propaganda is not to change people's minds, but to humiliate them um, and to show them who's boss. Uh, so maybe by building up hope and letting it down again, that's, that's what people are doing. You then just throw your hands up after a while. Exactly. I think it's also the illusion of control because it makes, it, I think even voting is the illusion of control, but it makes people think that they have some kind of say in the system or 
they have, as you said, uh, the white hats in the in the White House. Uh, it makes them feel like they have some control over something which really they don't. And if they realize that, that would be very dangerous to the power structure, I think. Voting is the illusion of control or the illusion of choice. Uh, it creates false hope. It makes people think that they have a say <clears throat> and they have control in a system that they don't. Um, and it also it has a kind of cathartic effect. Um, so anthropologically, there's something um, called the killing of the king. Uh, in a book called The Golden Bough, but there's kind of this anthropological ritual where we see leaders as kind of a scapegoat and we vent all our frustrations onto them. So you see this in the UK, oh, there's inflation, it's uh, Boris Johnson's fault. And in the US, they're like, oh, there's inflation, it's Biden's fault. It's, it's neither of their fault, it's just uh, like a natural kind of force in a way. But by directing all of your frustrations on the target, and you can see this... Um, and approval ratings for politicians go up when they come in and then across the course of their uh, tenure it goes down until they're replaced by someone else. Um, so they're kind of like a, a lure, they're kind of bait that people direct all their frustrations at. Uh, they're kind of a scapegoat which I think actually protects the actual power structure because if people shifted their focus again that would be quite dangerous for them. Like you know, I noticed in the people who are awake in the COVID thing they were f fearing, the mainstream was fearing the virus, and then the alternative was fearing the government, the, yeah. the looming technocracy that's going to kill you and eat mm -hmm. you, right? Yeah. And both created a sense of paralysis in people. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've seen it referred to as a polarity, like a battery or a magnet or something. You have to have these two sides that feed each other. And the most powerful thing you can do is kind of step away from that. I mean, obviously, you're going to have certain preferences and see the world in a certain way but even if you're fighting against something you're still engaging with it you're still part of that narrative maybe it's not the whole answer but it's definitely a big part of the answer is just don't engage just uh, try and put your mind somewhere else just relax uh, it, one brainwashing expert said it's like a bull uh, raging against the red flag eventually you'll be tired out and you'll get slaughtered so the only dogs that Pavlov couldn't condition were those who didn't even pay attention to the bells in the first place um, so it's a bit like a food critic they could eat McDonald's every day for dinner and say how salty and addictive it is but the food is still affecting their body so if you are consuming these nudges and content it will affect you psychologically so the best thing is try not to engage with it at all so I spoke to a magician for my new book and I asked him, how do you not get tricked by magicians? And he said, if you don't want to get tricked, don't go to the show. Part of the answer is just don't engage. Just uh